This is the 1978 Harley Davidson MX250, and we think it might be the most famous failure in motocross history. In this video, we'll take an in-depth look at the history of this project, we'll take a close look at the machine, and of course, we'll hear this beauty come to life. If you ask me, Harley-Davidson are without doubt the most famous and the most iconic motorcycle brand in the world. Whether you're a fan or not, you can't argue that everyone and their grandma knows who Harley-Davidson are and what they do. I don't think the same could be said for the likes of Ducati or KTM or even the Japanese Big Four. Harley-Davidson are a true American icon with a style and character all of their own. They were a big slice of the Americana that was marketed across the world during the 20th century, alongside the likes of Mickey Mouse, McDonald's and Michael Jordan. The company is a real American success story, and their origins could be used as a blueprint for anyone chasing the American dream. So when this giant of the two-wheeled world the quintessential motorcycle company with deep racing roots decided it wanted to join the dirt bike scene, you'd think they'd take it by storm, right? Well, you'd be wrong. This is the story of the 1978 Harley-Davidson MX250, the most famous failure in the sport's history. Dave, you've done it again, mate. This is a bike that we've had a lot of comments asking for us to find. I sent you a message, and literally within a couple of hours, you're like, yep, yeah, found one. Yeah, we Tell put, us what we're looking at. We put a call out, didn't we, in that last video. If there's anything you're, you'd like us to find, and somebody comes straight up, I bet you can't find a Harley 250 motocross bike. Well, hold my beer, we got one. Before we find out more about the machine that we have before us here today, Let's first take a look at the history of Harley-Davidson and work out how on earth the kings of the highway ended up playing with us in the mud. Harley-Davidson have been around for well over a hundred years now and today they have legions of dedicated followers. To call these guys fans just doesn't feel right. Being a Harley Davidson rider is a way of life for many of these people. And like I've said, they're a giant of the industry. But times haven't always been so sunny and bright for Harley Davidson. As with any company that survived this long, Harley Davidson have experienced their fair share of ups and downs. And that roller coaster ride has led Harley Davidson down some interesting paths. The story of Harley-Davidson begins at the start of the 20th century. In 1903, near Milwaukee, Wisconsin, three young innovators, William Harley, Arthur Davidson and Walter Davidson, came together to create something that would become a world-conquering empire. But their origins were humble. Their first machine looked more like a powered bicycle rather than a motorcycle. But the company evolved and grew rapidly. By the time the Americans entered World War I, Harley-Davidson were one of the globe's largest motorcycle manufacturers, and they were able to supply the US Army with 20,000 motorcycles to help in their war effort. As the Roaring Twenties came to a close, the stock market crashed and the world was rocked by the Great Depression. Harley-Davidson sales plummeted, dropping from 21,000 machines sold in 1929 to just 3,700 machines sold in 1933. But somehow they were able to pull through and survive. Harley-Davidson would be only one of two American motorcycle companies to make it out of the Great Depression alive. The other one being Indian motorcycles, of course. When the world was plunged into chaos once again with the outbreak of World War II, Harley-Davidson were far more successful than Indian in securing massive military contracts. It's reported that between 60 and 70,000 Harley-Davidson WLA machines were manufactured for the Allied forces. 
And it was this wartime production that helped Harley Davidson find huge success once the fighting was over. Many thousands of American GIs used these bikes during the war. They knew how to operate them and they knew how to fix them. So when they got home, they sought out Harley Davidson machines. And the soldiers that didn't ride the bikes in the war definitely saw them being used and ridden all over the world and they wanted a slice of that action when they got back to US soil. Obviously, there was also a surplus of these machines after the war, so they were available at good prices. The WLA bikes were widely modified and they became the first generation choppers and bobbers. The Harley Davidson movement was born and it would only grow from here. There is actually an interesting connection between the climax of World War II and the development of the Harley Davidson two-stroke motocross bike. But I'll tell you more about that a little later in the video. For now, I'll fast forward to 1969. Harley Davidson biking culture is in full swing at this point, but the company itself maybe isn't in the best position financially. In 1969, the Milwaukee firm was bought in full by AMF, which stands for American Machine and Foundry. AMF were a huge recreational equipment company that produced so many things from cigarette machines and garden equipment to atomic reactors and 10-pin bowling technology. They took over Harley-Davidson and tried to streamline production. They slashed the workforce and focused on cost cutting as much as possible. This resulted in a labor strike and a drop in quality. This fall off in quality and a, a loss in faith in the Harley Davidson brand coincided with the arrival of the Japanese Big Four as they entered the game and looked to take over the American motorcycle market. Harley Davidson were losing their American stronghold and they needed to do something about it. They needed to fight back the Japanese on all fronts. And at this time, motocross was a new and booming sport in the USA. Honda and Suzuki had established themselves as lords of the dirt in America. So maybe this is why Harley Davidson decided to enter the dirt bike game. After all, they needed to combat the Japanese wherever and however they could. It's safe to say that Harley Davidson are most definitely not synonymous with two strokes. So how did the MX250, a two stroke motocross bike, come to be? Well, let's head back to World War II. As part of the German reparations, basically the compensation that the Germans had to pay to the Allies after the war, Harley Davidson acquired the designs for the German made DKW RT125 which was a small two-stroke road bike. During the 1930s, DKW were the world's largest motorcycle manufacturer, and they actually did go on to create some very interesting motocross machines. In the post-war world, there was a high demand for motorcycles and an increased appetite for small capacity two-strokes. These two factors, combined with the acquisition of the DKW designs, led Harley Davidson down the two-stroke avenue and resulted in a string of American-made Harley-Davidson two-strokes being released over the next 18 or so years. These Harley two-strokes are often referred to as Hummers, but the Hummer was just one of the models that was produced between 1955 and 1959. In 1960, Harley-Davidson bought a 50% stake in the motorcycling division of an Italian aircraft manufacturer called Aramaki. Aramaki started producing motorcycles after the war and they were based in the Italian town of Varese, which is of course a famous motocross location. And if you don't already know, I'll explain why a little later on in the video. At first, they just imported rebadged four strokes from Italy. But when Harley Davidson stopped making two strokes in their American factories, they instead decided to replace those models with the lightweight two strokes that they could get from Italy. The Aramaki factory in Varese quickly became Harley Davidson's global two stroke HQ. In 1973, Harley Davidson purchased full control of the Aramaki motorcycle division, setting the scene well and truly for the production of their very first dirt bike.
Before the briefest time, Harley Davidson were a big player in the motocross world. They had a brand new production motorcycle and a top tier factory team at their disposal. They had the cash to effectively market their motorcycle and the dealer network to get the bikes out into the world. In their eyes, the 1978 Harley Davidson MX250 was an American made motocross machine that would be eaten up by a grateful and patriotic nation. But that's not exactly how it went. And in reality, the MX250 that we have with us here today wasn't actually their first attempt. In 1975, Harley Davidson produced a small run of 65 prototype motocross bikes that were hand built in Milwaukee. For suspension, these bikes essentially featured shortened front forks at the back instead of shocks, and no dealers wanted anything to do with them. So Harley Davidson went back to the drawing boards. And this was the result, the 1978 Harley Davidson MX250. Although it might have been marketed as the American answer to the Japanese invasion of the dirt bike world, the MX250 wasn't actually made in the USA, but in Italy at the Aramaki factory. The bike was assembled in Varese and the components were sourced from all over the world. But Harley Davidson had learned from their previous motocross mistakes. As you can see, this machine features a more conventional suspension setup for the time. The original 1975 prototype was said to be completely underpowered, so the 1978 version rectified that. The very modern 5 port 242cc two stroke motor from Italy provided much more power this time around. The cylinder was chrome, which was lighter and much better for heat dispersion, and it also helped that it resembled the factory Hondas. The bike used a 38mm Delorto carb from Italy and a Japanese made electronic ignition. The MX250 was finished off well, with its leather strap tank, rubber dampened cylinder fins, spring loaded chain tensioner, the Tomaselli levers and the premium shoulderless rims. It's reported that only about 900 of these machines were ever made. But this time around, Harley Davidson pretty much forced their dealers to take stock. With these limited numbers, the 1978 Harley Davidson MX250 was essentially a prototype bike offered on sale to the public. But nevertheless, it was still a well-built machine. So who remembers back in the day when you bought a brand new motocross bike, they came with Cheng Shin tires. I think they're all the way from China. Original tires still on the bike. I think it's uh, Arcron rims, which I think came from Spain. I'm pretty sure they did. The fuel tank, a very Husqvarna that looks like a Husky, sort of a mid 70s Husky tank, aluminium tank, really well built. Interesting little feature on it. If you come in this side, you can see there's a tiny little pipe there that goes through the frame and back to the other side to make sure that um, you don't run out of fuel because the, obviously you've got the, the backbone of the frame in between virtually splitting the tank so there was always fuel to the fuel tap and this bike was of an era where it was just before the what they called the FIM number plates where the number plate would have been at the back here this was the one where it was really hidden between between you oh by your legs KYB piggyback suspension which was really quite way ahead of its time because at that that time in 78, probably even Olin's didn't have a remote reservoir shock. So, you know, that, that they were ahead of the game there. One thing I do like is the, the rear fender, which I'm pretty sure would have been Preston Petty with the Harley Davidson logo on the back. That's dead cool. Now, Sunnet tells me on, if you want to come around this side, Sunnet tells me there was Sunnet not quite right with the gearing on these motors, judging by the size of the back sprocket. That, that is unusual to have such a big back sprocket. And then you've got the tiny, little tiny pea shooter exhaust. I mean, that's got to be probably an inch and a half in diameter. It's tiny by, you know, for a 250cc, that's more like a 125 silencer. Now you've got the, the brilliant leather strap on the tank i just think that really dates the bike it's just such a such a cool thing original grips original tomaselli 
levers which were hugely popular and really really good quality stuff back in the day just one other thing that i noticed that's very different to today's motocross bikes gear change no folding tip on it so if you hit a rock you were going to lose a gear shaft or or at best you were going to going to bend the um the gear stick out but just a nice bike well put together but just didn't get the results what's the story behind this machine we're looking at here so this is a collector friend of mine in the uk that owns it he actually bought this bike in florida maybe about 15 years ago it was originally uh, a dealer test bike so um, harley would have given it to a traditional harley um, road bike shop yep. and said try and sell that yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and from what i read up on that was a tough job <laughs> and they couldn't they couldn't sell them not because they probably weren't a bad bike but just the way they went about trying to sell they them they were trying to sell them to the hogs right they, they were trying, trying to sell them to the wrong audience it was a difficult sell but yeah this one was found in florida and it ended up in a museum and it's now here in sunny uk and it's, it's in good nick right it's it's not brand new like you said it was used we think in that dealership but all original right all original yeah not brand new but a collector's dream it's nut and bolt perfect yeah. perfect patina and just a lovely example of a very very rare bike right. i love the leather strap that sort of takes you back to a completely different era yeah. in motocross you tell me dave what is the point <laughs> to stop it, it, because petrol tanks used to come off back, <laughs> back in the early days it's to stop the tank from coming off from what I can gather, it appears as though Harley Davidson were very nervous of critical reviews. So the bike was never really available for magazine testers to try out. However, I did manage to find a few snippets online from the very few riders that were able to try out and review the MX250. Reportedly, the bike was a handful on track. Peak power was good, as we've already mentioned, but the breadth of that power wasn't so great. They said it was all or nothing on the MX250 and that it ran like a big 125 with all of the power high in the rev range. Low end torque just didn't exist and the mid range wasn't great either. For the best results you were advised to keep it pinned and don't lose momentum. The reports that I've read say that getting the most out of the MX250 took a lot of skill. Apparently the clutch wasn't very easy to operate and the suspension just wasn't up for handling this big lump of a motorcycle. The actual componentry of the suspension was good. The 36mm KYB forks were top of the line stuff with 9 inches of travel and a leading axle for more precise turning. The problem was that the suspension came standard spec the same as an RM250, which was a much lighter machine. The suspension performed well to a certain degree. It was plush enough in the small chop but it just could not handle the big impacts. All nine inches of travel front and rear was used to soak up the impacts of the big jumps and the big bumps. They say the suspension performed absolutely fine out on the trails, but it just wasn't up for proper hardcore motocross riding. So essentially you had a serious motocross motor with trail bike suspension. Being 250 pounds, this bike could never really be called a nimble little thing, but apparently it did handle quite well, with that 51 inch wheelbase providing good high speed stability. The brakes were okay, although the front was much better than the rear and the pipe didn't tuck in very well, so your legs could easily get roasted. The swing arm was also pretty crude and ugly, being made up of smaller plates welded together. The MX250 might not have been the perfect motocross machine, but I think it's fair to say that no bike from that era was exactly perfect. Most reviews from that time were full of concerns and questions. So in the main, success in the showroom was a direct result of success at the racetrack. What can you remember about Harley Davidson entering the motocross world obviously you was a, a young man back then yeah, Dave but do you have any memories of I, of the massive huge Harley Davidson coming into our little old sport I do yes so this was ridden by um three guys three big names in the states at the time Rick Eiderstadt Rocket Rex Staten and Marcy Tripes Marcy the Tripes. first ever supercross winner yep so this bike you know was uh, I think this bike did do some supercross uh, did, races yeah, yeah i've yeah. got i found some results 
Racer X actually really ha helpfully had a whole list of results from the 1977 season this was raced and then sold in 78. Yeah. So I'll put a list of results that I found, but had some decent results against some good competition. It did, and back then, don't forget, you know, um, all of the Japanese brands were really fine-tuning their bikes, and this bike was really probably, if I'm honest, outdated before it even got on the track. Yeah. Harley-Davidson entered the motocross scene all guns blazing and quickly assembled a formidable factory squad. Having won the first ever stadium event in the sport, Marty Trites was one of the most famous riders of his generation. But by the time of his Harley Davidson signing, he perhaps didn't have the best reputation for work ethic. He had ridden for five factory teams in four years. So it was Rocket Rex Staten then, who signed for Harley in 1976, that really gave the Harley Davidson program a sense of legitimacy. Although the bike we're looking at today is called the 1978 MX250, it was actually produced and raced in 1977, ready to be sold to the public in 1978. So when you search back through the motocross history books, it's actually the 1977 season that you need to look at to find Harley Davidson in the result sheets. I was able to find 25 results for a Harley Davidson powered Rocket Rex. The best of which was a third overall at the Unadilla National behind Tommy Croft and Marty Smith. I found 10 race results for Marty Tripes on board the Harley Davidson, his best being a 7th place at the Anaheim Supercross and a 4th overall at the Hangtown National behind Marty Smith, Jim Pomeroy and Tony DiStefano. I would say that there were some very respectable results here, especially for a first year factory team fielding their first ever motocross machine. But I guess the MX250 didn't exactly outshine a lot of the competition or set the motocross world alight. So we know all about the racing history of the MX250 and I showed you guys some of the results. But to get the insider information on what it was actually like to race for Harley Davidson and what it was like to ride this bike in competition, we are honored to have Rocket Rex himself with us all the way from California I was able to catch up with Rex and ask him a few questions about the MX250. I thought what would be good for the video is to talk to someone that actually raced one in real life. Hence the message. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it was kind of outdated. It reminded me of old DT1 Yamaha, what it reminded me of, basic. But, you know, I gave it all I had. Our, little, our 360 was a little better, but I was still way down on power and... Uh, yeah, at first they wanted me to ride that one with the forks on the back, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think so. And I went out and rode it, and it was terrible. I said, no, I'm not going to ride that. And then they ended up putting shocks on it, and we worked on it and did a lot of work. And I used to carry my Yamaha forks off of my practice bike out here back east every time I went racing and carried it in the brakes because the brakes didn't work worth a darn, and then I used the Yamaha brakes, and then I had the Yamaha front end on it and got it to work halfway decent. And I just trained hard and uh, actually was in good shape. And that's why I could do halfway decent, you know, because I could outlast everybody. In comparison to the other bikes of the time then, what was it a lot slower? What were its good traits and its bad traits? Uh, it didn't really handle that good, but um, it wasn't that fast either. If it was probably faster, it would have handled worse. But for the speed it was, it was okay. You know, I, I managed, I just hung in there and gave it all I had, you know, when I was riding them. Just tell me a little bit about the um, the 360, right? Because it was sold as the 250, but you raced a bigger version. Just tell us about that. What they did was they just took a, a cylinder and put a different cylinder on it and punched it out. It was over square, but uh, it, it was a 360, I guess they said. And uh, I just rode that. And I remember going to Italy a couple of times and do some testing and it lasted about 20 minutes and they blew up and then I rode another one for 20 minutes they blew up and they said okay you can go home now. <laughs> yeah. Was it true that you didn't have a, a practice one at home then? No I didn't have no practice bike. I always rode my Yamaha. What were Harley Davidson actually like to work with as a, a factory team? Were they easy to work with or like you said, did you have to go to Italy every time to test? And what was the organization actually like? No, they were okay. Uh, Dick O'Brien was really good. And I had a couple of mechanics, uh, Steve Stores. They tried hard. Tom Bolin, he tried hard. 
and uh, what we had, the equipment we had. I mean, we wasn't nothing like the Honda factory and the Yamaha and the Kawasaki's, you know. But I gave them kind of a hard time to do the best I could, you know. The first race I ever rode on it was Orlando, Florida. I went back there, and it's just sand whoops and stuff. And I ended up winning that, the first race ever on it. Oh, really? And they just thought, oh, my God, you, you know, we got a good bike. And I'm like, ha, I don't know about that, but... <laughs> I know I was in good shape, you know, and I beat Tony DiStefano and stuff, and he was on a factory Suzuki at that time. And then, uh, you know, Dilla, one year I got pretty good in the open class. I think I ended up, one more lap I should have won. I, I caught up to Marty Smith. I got a bad start. I was like last, and I worked my way all the way through the pack, got up to second, and I figured one more lap I would have got Marty. And, uh, but I ended up getting second at Unadilla on it. But we had 45-minute motos back then, yeah. you know. Do you think if Harley Davidson stuck with it a little, little bit longer, the bike could have become better? Or why do you think they just kind of ran away after one season? It started in 75, but I got picked up in 76. And then I did 76, 77. And then I think they picked up uh, Don Kodolski in 79. And they were getting a little better, but they would need to actually kind of do like what the factory Honda and Yamaha guys do. They go and get other bikes and then tear them apart and see what's good about them, what's bad about them. Because everybody used to go and get Makos. You know, the factories would get Makos and copy Makos because the Makos were so good, Yeah. you know, back in the day. And uh, they would have needed to do something like that. It would have took them, I would say it probably would have took them five years. And then they could have probably been pretty competitive. Uh, final question for me then. Um, did you think when you was racing a Harley Davidson in 1977, you'd be still talking about it in 2023? Uh, I know I had a lot of people said, "Why didn't you keep them?" I said, "Nah, I just I don't want no part of it. I just thought, eh, whatever." But it's amazing. I mean, for them to come out into the motocross thing, I mean, they were pretty good in flat track and stuff with the big 750s. Well, Rex, thank you so much for your time. That's perfect for our video. Um, okay, no problem. I appreciate it. Any time, if you need anything, just give me a holler. Even after all of the dollars spent on marketing and the money poured into the factory race team, the MX250 just did not sell. It was an utter failure. But why did it fail so badly? And what happened next? We'll discuss that in more detail very soon before we hear this specimen get fired into life. But before we get to that, I just want to go off on a little tangent to say that Aramaki Harley Davidson did find some major success on the racetrack before it all went wrong. They actually won four road racing world championships thanks to a super fast Italian called Walter Villa. He won the 1974, 1975 and 1976 250 cc world championships on board a Harley Davidson as well as the 1976 350cc World Championship. I just thought that was a cool little footnote to include whilst talking about Harley Davidson's racing history. So what happened? Why did the motocross project only last 12 months? And why did the whole thing fail so drastically? Well, the numbers just don't lie. The bikes did not sell. As I've already mentioned, only about 900 of these machines were ever made and many went unsold. A lot of them never even made it to the USA. And I guess that the dealers that did take the MX250 didn't really know a lot about the bikes or the sports. I also guess that the Harley riders of the time did not give two hoots about trying to ride off-road. And also, the average dirt bike rider was unlikely to wander into their local Harley dealership looking for their next raced weapon. And if there were any dirt biking hogs out there, they might have been put off by the price of the MX250, which was about two to $300 more expensive than the Japanese alternatives. The MX250 cost $1,695 back in 1978. And finally, perhaps the US market really did want their American savior to be American made and not a European bitzer. Motocross was booming in the States in the 70s, wasn't it? It was, yeah. it was just growing at an exponential was, rate. It and was they exploding. Were, and they was like, we've got American bike now, come and ride it. Yeah. But it, it was, was made, made in Italy. Yeah. Japanese forks and 
Japanese and shocks. For shocks, electricals, I think. I think the hubs were from France, the rims were from Spain, frame was from Germany, not a lot of American <laughs> bits on it. I think the plastics... The petrol was American. And, and that was American. So not too much, but the Japanese were coming in and taking over the sport. Yeah. And this bike was more expensive than those it as well. It was, and it was heavier, which was... It's, which, it's very heavy. Yeah. We've well, been pushing well, it around. We just put it on the stand, you do notice. Yeah, for sure. 250 pounds, this bike was. The whole Harley-Davidson motocross thing, it's got really themes of what's going on today with Triumph. You know, Harley Davidson were known for their road bikes, yeah. Triumph known for their road bikes, and Triumph now just getting into motocross. So the whole thing has sort of got shades yeah, of shades of that about it. That Let's hope Triumph have more success yeah. than, than again, Harley did. I've said it before in videos, like I hope that Triumph have looked at projects from the past like this, like the Cannondale, and they've, they've looked and they've learned they've and learned, listened yes. Exactly. Same with Ducati as well. Exactly. To finish this off then, Dave, why do you think this bike failed? Why I've called it the most famous failure in motocross because Harley Davidson, I think without question, is probably the most famous motorcycle brand in the world. Like everyone's grandma's heard of Harley Davidson, right? Why do you think they did not succeed in our sport? Because they were up against the Japanese and the mighty German Mako bikes that were pretty much dialed in at that stage. This was really a conglomeration of, of parts from gathered from around the globe. They did a good job, but it just wasn't quite good enough. Yeah, and they didn't stick it out for very long, did they? No, I think they it was like pretty much over and when they committed to a factory team, a new production bike, and then within a year or two, it was, it was gone. No matter how you slice it, the MX250 was an utter flop. The most famous motorcycle company in the world had completely failed to break into the motocross market. And their retreat was drastic. In 1978, Harley-Davidson sold Aramaki to a couple of brothers from Varese with the last name Castiglione. Claudio and Gianfranco rebranded their new motorcycle business using the company name that their father, Giovanni, had used, Kajiva. The death of Aramaki Harley-Davidson was at the same time the birth of Kajiva motorcycles. And in a sort of poetic conclusion, Kajiva did become the brand to defeat the Japanese giants, which of course was one of Harley-Davidson's original aims. In 1985, riding a factory Kajiva, Pekka Vekkonen put a stop to Suzuki's 10-year reign as kings of the 125 World Championship. Even after the sale of Aramaki, Harley-Davidson still weren't in a great financial position. The mother company, AMF, just got too big and too diverse. Their facilities were too old and their management wasn't so great. When sales in various areas began to decline, AMF just weren't in a position to react and adjust quickly enough. In the early 80s, the company was in trouble. So, in 1981, AMF sold Harley-Davidson back to a group of 13 investors, which included Willie Davidson. Over time, the American icon was able to recover from this troubled period in their story. AMF, however, would never recover. By the 1990s, they no longer existed. Since Harley-Davidson's first fall in the motocross world, there have been a few more instances of their involvement in the sport. In the early 2000s, Harley-Davidson owned an American sports bike company called Buell. And apparently in 2007, they had begun the process of starting a 450 motocross project. That was to be led by Dave Osterman, who you might know as the former team manager of 2-2 Motorsports. But that project was killed off by the recession in 2008 and was never revisited. Over the years, we've also seen some very special custom Harley-Davidson motocross bikes like the very cool MP119 Harley that we see behind me here. That was created by UK pro racer Mel Pocock. But to this day, the 1978 MX250 remains the only real Harley Davidson motocross machine. And there can't be many of them left in the world. We're very lucky to see one in person because from what I know, they only made 900 of these in the first place. I believe so, yeah. Um, most of those probably, well, I, I believe most of those went unsold. That's yeah. why, you know, you still see them today in, in such good, good condition. 
an incredibly rare bike probably still defined in the USA. I, get, I reckon there's probably more outside of America than there is inside of America. But this isn't it for us today, Dave. You've got some more interesting We've got bikes. some more really oddball bikes that really are, are very, very interesting. So they'll be in a, another video. So make sure you subscribe to the channel because we've got more of these weird bikes coming your way. Dave is always looking out on the search, on the hunt. If you've got any suggestions, drop in the comments, let us know. But Dave, as always, thanks very much, no mate. No problem, Max. Found another Pleasure. gem here. We've been very lucky to be able to showcase this machine to you guys today, especially one in such good condition. I'm told that the fenders, airbox, and shocks that we see on this bike are just unobtainable today. So it truly was very cool to take a closer look at this machine but it was even cooler to see it come back to life once again. As this is one of our last uploads of the year, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you once again to our channel sponsors, Pewterline Oils and 24MX for supporting what we do and helping us have one of the best years ever on the channel. These videos wouldn't be possible without them. So be sure to check out 24MX and Pewterline next time you need to stock up on your dirt bike essentials. I also want to say thank you to you guys for watching this year and joining us on the ride. Also, a huge shout out goes to Dave King as always, to Rocket Rex Staten for giving us the time in this video, and to Doug Duback for helping us to set up that video call. Cheers guys, as always, my name is Max. Until next time, I'll see you at the track.